This episode was sponsored by NFT Ventures Miami. Join the NFTV mailing list for the sickest drops. Welcome back to the World Crypto Network. We're joined by Daniel Friedman, author of one of the Curio cards. Uh, how's it going, Daniel? Pretty well, Mad Bitcoins. Thanks so much for having me on. Well, uh, we're going to go ahead and start out like I have the other interviews, just asking you with the beginning of how did you get involved with the Curio Card project? You know, like so many other stories, the beginning is shrouded in uh, forgetfulness for me. I don't remember exactly how I got the web form, but I do remember filling out a form and thinking, I like art, I like crypto, and this is a natural overlap and fit. Submitted it into the ether, quite literally, and didn't hear back for some time until I saw them posted. And I guess that's the first chapter. So for me, on the other side of that, uh, we had the Curio card project that I started with Rhett and Travis, and we were working on making cards and we, we knew a couple of artists. So my friend Philippe did the early cards, a friend of ours from the Bitcoin meetup, Crypto Graffiti did some more. Uh, another friend, Rick, turned us on to his friend, Luis, who's now doing really well in NFTs with Crypto Pop. And uh, he did those great dog cards. And then I think we did a Mad Bitcoins card. Uh, then we started to recruit artists just from the internet. So like you say, we had a Google form. I'm pretty sure I made it. Uh, went to a spreadsheet, asked you basic questions about your gallery and you know what kind of art you make and maybe write a paragraph why you should be a curio card artist. Just trying to kind of sort out those fakes. Uh, but as it was, we didn't even have that many fakes. We probably had about 10 or 20 submissions. Uh, one of them was Robeck. Uh, and it was uh, what it was for me it was for all about uh, confirming that the artists were real and that they really did the work. So when I looked at Robex and I went to his website and he had Robex World and it was a blog and he had all these cartoons and they all look similar. I was like, this is the guy doing the work. If he produces a cartoon, looks like me holding up three fingers, whatever it is, it's obviously the real person. So the same thing when we got to your entry. I pulled up your art and I looked at the kind of pen and ink drawings and I looked at the flicker. And I was like, wow, there's, you know, a hundred of these or whatever. There's a lot of these. I was like, he's clearly making these in my mind. I thought that you were like bored in school and you're like making these on your notebook or whatever. And you had a very a precise to it, a geometric pattern, like a, maybe like a Islamic thing, like the, the great pyramids and things and the, um, Burj Khalifa and all that kind of thing, but it had a great style to it. And I thought, well, he's obviously 100% really making these. So I was like, we'll slot these in. These will be the next one we'll do. And then after that, we did Marisol Vingas, uh, which has now been revealed to be my friend Max Infeld from Chico. Uh, so he's a big artist up in the Chico. And after that, uh, Travis's friend Thoros of Mir rounded out pretty much the curio card artists. I think there's about seven. Uh, so that's, that's how you got chosen. Uh, that's how you got picked as far as the rest of the stuff. Very small company, uh, very, you know, trying to be a company. And we put it together. We got the cards out there. Uh, I think Travis and I did a show launching them, trying to sell them, trying to get them to people. And uh, with your cards, it was kind of interesting uh, because we had an interesting thing happen on the previous set with Robeck, where with the artist cards from the internet, at, at first we'd printed a large amount of cards and we'd try to raise money for the company on the first 10 cards. Then... We printed, I think, about 2,000 cards each, like 1,000 cards each. We were trying to limit the number down because we'd started at like 200,000. And we're like, we'll just print 200,000 at a dollar. We'll raise $200,000 for the company and it will be set. We'll start, you know, a startup like a Silicon Valley TV show. And uh, it didn't work. <laughs> but uh, th so we let the artist choose the number of the cards. And Robeck had less numbers for his cards. And then when you did yours cards, you did 333, 222, and 111. So first, let me ask you, why did you choose those numbers? And, and then we'll talk about how it worked out. Thanks for the recap. Let me just mention a few points. So first, you mentioned the proof of life and the proof of art, the proof of work, getting the work done. So it's so interesting how those three proofs and the way that they lean on each other. Art is the proof of human, and the human is the proof of work. So that's kind of cool. And then what you mentioned about drawing and being bored in class. Yes, that's absolutely true. So thank you to all patient teachers everywhere. And it moved from drawing in the margins of my notes to the underlying sheet to no pretenses, just drawing. And that 
that phase change was something that really imbued into the drawings. And definitely it's reflected in the drawings from different periods because I started uploading to the Flickr in 2009. And for the first several years of drawing seriously and uploading, I was working only in black and white, purely abstractly with no writing, no symbols. And then it developed as I did and it entered into more symbolic and eventually into more textual bases. But just to get to the question about the number, the 333-222-111, it's interesting to hear that you started from the 200,000 down because as a, I guess you could call it a manual artist, I, I, I make slides and presentations, but when I'm doing art, for me, it's about the drawing and the pen and the paper and the accessibility and the familiarity of that. So for me, even two is scaling up. So I was on the other side of the three digit numbers looking up thinking, wow, I would need a photocopier and a ream of paper to make a few hundred of these drawings. Wouldn't that be amazing? Like a poster printer. And then as for the numbers themselves, I like repetition. I like patterns, controlled novelty. If it was all just three of the same three digit number, like all three, three, threes, uh, that's not enough novelty. So how do we embed multi-scale controlled novelty and leave something for everybody to find mystery and meaning in? Those numbers present themselves to me. And then it was actually later when I found out about a few cars that had gone missing, which is kind of a funny little addendum to that story. So what it also did though, by going so low with card number 26 at 111, there can now only be 111 complete sets of curio cards. Uh, for the collectors out there. So I'm kind of curious to see if just as a natural thing, you know, how cables get tangled and things get destroyed and empathy and all that entropy, entropy and energy moving around and all that. Will the curio cards out there form into 111 complete sets? Like how close will we go? I've already seen maybe just two complete sets on Twitter where, uh, and again, as a, as a creator of these cards and a person trying to encourage this collector's mentality, even you know four years ago, I'm psyched to see it now. I'm psyched to see that people saw what I saw. Where I was like, "You want a complete set? You want a complete set of like the Daniel cards? You want a complete set of all the cards? Like you are a collector of the Crypto Pop cards, whatever it is. Everyone finds a way to collect these, and any way is correct. You're not told that you have to make a complete set or whatever. But people were drawn to it, and then they did exactly what I hope they did. It. They took a screenshot of it. They put it on Twitter proudly. Of course, I retweeted them and everything for what that's worth, but uh, you don't get much more than that. But still, you completed a complete set of curio cards, uh, which is even harder given your one 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 card. It's it's a, a a duty and an honor and a privilege to be the rate limiting step for a bigger project, and it is interesting. Got to catch them all. I mean, you got the state quarters, and there's all fifty. And if you only have forty, then come on, you need those last ten. And then it is very interesting with the different numbers. I have those blue coin collecting books too. And I don't know why I do it. And even uh, at the beginning, it's hard to remember back, but at the beginning of this whole stay at home for a year nightmare, I was like, yeah, I'll do my coin sorting. And I'm like, oh, it's a 62 quarter. Oh, it's a 69. Oh, this is, I don't know that it's fun or not, but I did it. And again, it's all about filling in those little holes. Like you have the four out of five and you're like, I wonder if I can get that fifth one. And it's just this collector's need. You know, the one thought on that, it's almost like the years, it's not that the number 1969, 1992, the years are special because there's actually a referent. There's something that it means and there's a continuity and a wholeness. And so it, it's just such an interesting impulse that we're striving for completeness. And now we have a toy that lets us do that online. Well, and as a historian, I love it when they put a date or a year on anything I was looking at an old smoke detector recently and they put probably a paragraph of where it's all about the company and where it was from and where it traveled and all the different numbers and qualifications that this device had, but no one put a year, no one put just copyright 1979 or whatever. So I couldn't date the smoke detector without more information. And uh, that drives me crazy. On the other side, I also love looking at the coin and thinking, wow, you know, it's a a 1960 quarter. This was around since JFK's time. This has been kicking around pocket to pocket. What a unique history. And in some ways, these new NFTs, as well as Bitcoin and Ethereum, these 
blockchain trackable transactions with the tree behind them, uh, you could track that. You could say who owned this 1960 quarter all the way back to when they had their curio card launch for quarters. I hope it went well. <laughs> the quarter, the quarter ICO. It reminds me actually of Where's George, which was a little bit of a meme where they stamped at least US dollars and they're fungible in one sense, dollars are, in that you can trade, most people will trade you dollars for each other. But where's George? Because there is a serial number on each dollar bill, it almost made it into an NFT. And that's what moved from having the bill tagged with a year and um, implicitly the community of people who are using US dollars and took it into the explicit. Because all of a sudden, you didn't just have time and implicit community, you had place and explicit community. So it's really powerful what you described that these mechanisms allow us to make time, place, and community come together in a meaningful way. It's also another really good way towards understanding NFTs and what they are. If you were walking around a festival and you had a, a wallet full of dollar bills and you took them to your friend and he painted orange hair on each one of the dollar bills, and you now, like a Where's George, valued those more, maybe valued those at $5, went around trading those to your friends and then went around the festival and said, okay, who has the orange uh, dollar bill? I'm giving you all 20s. Uh, that's the same idea as kind of what's been happening with these NFTs. You say something that's fungible, that's tradable, like a dollar or a quarter, and you make it non-fungible and unique, which sometimes increases the value and other times decreases the value and no one will ever want it. So I, I, everyone needs to take track that there's both sides to that. Yep. Scarcity does not imply value for any system because the total value, whether there's one or a hundred or 21 million of something, the total value in the trust can be zero. So scarcity isn't alone value. But what you said there reminds me of a little bit of a joke in the research community with nonlinear models. People will often talk, oh, it's a nonlinear model. But non-linear model just means anything except a linear model. So the linear model is the special narrow case. Easily computable, it has some nice properties, but non-linear models is the bigger space. So then I think about NFTs and it's like, hey, everything you've heard or thought likely about cryptocurrency was fungible tokens, though there's some technical details, of course. Now think that's the tip of the iceberg. Everything other than that, actually everything other than that, because many or everything will be tokenized, it's either going to be fungible or non-fungible. And just like the set of non-elephant animals is bigger than the amount of elephants, non-fungible tokens are going to come to mean so many things. And the value is always what we make of it. So if somebody else doesn't want to hold the NFT corresponding to a leadership position in my organization, great. They just don't have to, they don't have to play. So it's a fun way that we're seeing it happen just at lightning speed. And it's neat to have come so long in this because I think it was a long time ago now, maybe seven or eight years, uh, but I was talking to my friend Andreas Antonopoulos and he was saying that everyone on the playground would have their own coin and there'd be Joey coin and Freddy coin and Tom coin. And maybe Joey's really popular. So his coins trade at two to one to Freddy coin. And if Joey wants to have a party and say you have to have Joey coin to go to the party, Joey can do that. Like these tokens, whether they're Bitcoin or NFTs or colored coins or whatever you want to call them, a counterparty, all these systems, uh, it's just a way for, you know, Joey coins to get traded and for Joey to then do whatever he wants with it. He could say, you get to watch my YouTube video or you get to comment on my blog or you get to do something in the real world. All of these things are available as soon as we empower Joey by giving him his own coin. And art is the tip of the spear. It's the exploration into this wild area that's being enacted and being mapped by those who go. And those who don't go and look at it from afar, maybe they'll see a bigger picture, maybe they'll see a distorted picture, but in some sense, it's creating an ecosystem where that doesn't matter because we can move towards pluralism and people valuing different things. And some people want to hold one national currency or one type of physical object, or maybe it's a physical hardware wallet. It's all good. 
It would be strange, though, if we go as far as a dark mirror type episode where everything is paid and everything is in exchange. And you say hello to someone and they send you $100 in their coin and you say back and you send them 50 and then you get a donut and you don't like it. and You turn them down and you go up and down and just all these uh, monetary exchanges complicating uh, normal existence. Uh, it would be interesting to see how far that goes. Well, that relates to the bandwidth of communication. And if we imagine a situation where I can't read the menu, it's a language I don't know, and I'm holding a different currency, but maybe I can put out an offer, like whatever that, I don't know what the name of your tasty looking food is, but here's how many of my currency I'm willing to have. And then they can recognize that in a market like system, and then they can make their own evaluation and they can consent to make the trade or not, but it, it enables a new interface that isn't just natural, expressive, but informal human language. It could affect barter too, if you could properly identify the value of things and then swap them. It's a lot of swapping. But I, I think we need to head back towards Curio cards where all of this value came together because when we started doing the rollback cards, uh, there were less of them and we still don't know who this person is, but somebody came in and started buying them all. Uh, now, I always bought some test cards, and uh, of course, I'm interested in baseball cards and getting a complete set and all that. Uh, but somebody else came in like it was an ICO, and they cleaned out those Robeck cards. And I think by the time we did the show with Robeck, there was a handful of cards left, and I think he, he swapped them up because he was the author of the cards. Uh, but by the time your cards came out at 333222 and 111, uh, I'm pretty sure this whale swallowed up most of the 111 cards. Uh, I'm pretty sure my collection is incomplete uh, because I don't have a 26. I also don't think I have a 29. Uh, similar whales uh, had entered into Kiro cards even in 2017. So uh, how does it feel to be the, you know, the artist who sold out in his time in 2017? It's cards gone. Uh, we were able to send you the funds. It wasn't complicated. A lot of the other things were complicated because uh, cards just didn't sell. You know, we didn't have the money. Uh, we didn't have the money to buy the cards from the machines even. You know, we had food bills and rent bills. We're just normal people. Uh, but eventually we did get everyone paid. But you got paid in the time period. So uh, how did that go? How did you feel selling out? Oh, selling out for the first time. What a special memory. You never forget your first sellout. No, it, it was very interesting because just doing my art recreationally and not ever seeing a way to monetize directly. It's a bit of a catch 22 because I didn't want to sell any of my originals. There was also low demand, of course, but I didn't really want to sell the original because first off, I value it. And second off, somebody might want it for more later. And then there's other ways to monetize art. Oh, having a so-called social media following or having a Patreon, having other mechanisms. And so to find a very unexpected mechanism that was compatible with the physical and the digital objects that I wanted to have, as well as the right balance between sovereignty over my own online presentation, and then allowing others to do what I had always hoped, which was think that a pattern is cool. They're all creative commons. People have gotten tattoos. Maybe people will put it on a shirt or they'll just put it up printed for free on their wall. So it was so interesting how the security and the cryptographic guarantees, which years ago, very few people were thinking of applying to art because art is the experience and it's the creation and it's the human side. Yet here was a technology that was allowing an unmonetized artist to structure basically an art lifestyle and potentially in the future fund an art lifestyle. Fantastic. It was, it was a beautiful dream, right? It was a great idea. And like many ideas, I think we were just too early, uh, maybe even just by months, right? If you look back uh, a few months later, uh, not that many people knew about it, but the crypto punks project. And I think the moon cats project both launched around that time. And then later on, crypto kitties came in and they crashed ethereum and they had generative uh, cats where it had a hat and that one had a cigar and that one had a hat and a cigar so that's very valuable uh, so it was a bit of a different project ours were more baseball cards more art based uh, nfts more like the modern nft where there's an art picture on the front rather than having like a generative art picture 
Uh, but mm. then the market kind of went quiet and things kind of went away. Uh, so what did you think about it? You'd made, uh, you know, 500, 700 bucks or something, uh, a little bit of Ethereum in your pocket. Uh, did you think it was going to come back? Did you think uh, you were going to make more cards? Uh, what did you think about it? You know, actually, after seeing the Curio cards posted, I wasn't paid the F directly. Um, and I forgot about it and let sleeping cards lie. And it really wasn't until just a couple of weeks ago when the engines restarted. And that was when I was provided the same amount in ETH. So thanks to Travis for hodling onto it for me and for making good uh, in all time. And all's well that ends well. So it's totally all good. Um, yeah, I got a couple of emails out of the blue. People who didn't even mention it specifically, just asking if, if weird unrelated requests and I wasn't putting the puzzle pieces together. Did you get, it a, wasn't message, on the did you get a message like, got any cards because that's what i got and i was like magic cards baseball cards like i got a lot of cards i don't know i won't read out anyone's emails but certainly they were kinds of requests that i had never received and then only by taking a step back and actually just asking an inquiry saying look i don't think i'm in the know here could you fill me in they directed me to the discord where i got to hear a little bit more and yeah, as to being early or not, I'd say uh, in the beginning and in the end, there will be curio. So to be second or second to last, that's like being an internal book on the shelf, which is awesome. But I think curio will always be a special thing. That's what is amazing about it. a lot of people are going back and forth on the discord about if the project's important or if it has to be successful to be important. Uh, but on the blockchain, it doesn't matter. I mean, we're on the Ethereum blockchain. You can go check it out. May 9th, 2017, before everyone else, not Rare Pepe. Rare Pepe was before us, but they're on the counterparty uh, Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, and it's just different. But other than that, uh, yeah, we're the only game in town. It's cryptographically provable. We couldn't fake it. If we had all the computers in the world, I don't think we could rewrite the chain. So, And I, I like Curio. It's, it's um, curiosity. And it's collection, eclectic, it evokes a lot of ideas that I think bring an element of mystery and curiosity to something that seems cut and dry. I mean, blocks, Legos, yet there's also this fascia, this connection, and the connection is curiosity and humanity. So it brings that back into play. Well, it's interesting. It was uh, The name was Travis's idea. I probably would have went more with something like Cyber Cards or something more in that that vein, uh, but he liked the curio and the curiosity, and I was I was pretty mixed on it. You never know why a project fails. You think maybe it's the name, maybe it's this, it's that kind of thing. Uh, but the funniest thing happened just around the time that Curio Cards got rediscovered uh, six months ago or whatever it was. Uh, I googled it, and a company put out a press release that they raised a million dollars, and they're calling themselves Curio, and they're making NFTs. And it sounded like, I don't want to, this will be read back to me in the trial, I'm sure, but it sounded like some entertainment industry veterans who had great connections to companies like Showtime, who were able to make a limited run of NFTs for Showtime, which seemed sold out when I checked them. So congratulations to the Curio uh, company. But uh, it was really funny to see this giant, well-organized, well-funded startup group uh, take a similar name uh, to our, our good old-fashioned uh, historic project. Uh, so that, that was a surprise. Well, ask not for whom the nonce tolls were all subject to the chain in that way. So great. You have legacy connections. You got a marketing team. Again, that's great. But will you play by a shared set of rules? And will that set of rules contain not just a computational kernel, but values and a practice and a participatory sense? No, I think they're just here for the money, <laughs> but, uh, for the USD. Yeah. Yeah. For the, the UST. So it's a new altcoin you haven't heard about, but they're printing more of them all the time. So, uh, so after you got on the discord and then I saw your interview on uh, Adam McBride's show, uh, how's it gone? I mean, are you, are you a famous artist now? Are you going to make more NFTs? Do you think the NFT space is a, a bubble or a fad? How do you feel about it? 
interesting questions. Well, certainly since re-engaging on the Discord, I've tried to listen to some of your conversations and some of Adam's and learn more. And it's funny to be sort of dropped onto the field and that's learning by doing, which is the mode that I love being in. And I'm just looking forward to seeing where it goes as far as other art NFTs. So I've uh, about 900 or a few more drawings on Flickr and of course, many unscanned drawings. So I thought potentially if Curio starts uh, taking hold and getting anchored and there's interest in the collection, then it could make sense to offer on whatever platform makes sense because I'm not a, a technical person on this level. So I would hope to connect with the right advisor or the right group, but then have some so sort of other issuance just complete the Daniel collection, which is the other drawings, except for the three that I selected for the curio cards. So maybe offer another set. And the part I'm most interested, I think, in learning more and experimenting with is just unconventional structures for governance, information, value, trust. Is there a way to make this second issuance of NFTs related to something special that would encode values into an object? I don't know. It's a question that's just the opening of a door because we haven't even seen the beginning. So as to, is it a bubble? That's kind of like asking, is the cell a bubble? It's like, well, you know, it's, it's spherical and it grows and it shrinks, but it's alive. So bubble for what? It's just a metaphor based upon blowing bubbles in the air. And it's not my mapping for what's happening with crypto of any kind. Well, if you like that, I think you're going to love Alien Worlds. I don't know very much about it. My friends tell me about it and I'm interested. Uh, the basic idea I understand is you take cards like a captain of the ship and like an engine and a mining ray, right? And you put those cards in your, your ship and then you mine their currency with this. And if you have better cards, you mine better. And they're doing things you talked about, like planets and governance, and they're having some kind of an election. And uh, I don't know what's going on, but just like everything else that I uh, get interested in but put to the side, it went up like 10,000% and it's on Binance. And everyone's like, wow. So I don't know what's going to happen. But again, I like seeing these ideas. I like seeing these you know, NFTs, these cards being used in the game. And then what I want to see is I want to see a competing game come out and have a competing currency and use the same cards and like steal or pirate or whatever kind of word you want to use there, borrow their assets so that eventually these cards are staked on someone else's computer system rather than the original system. And that's to me where it gets really interesting because now the game companies are competing for these assets. And if the special sword is on your game company for a couple of days, your game company could make tons of money somehow. I mean, it would be it would be the place where the sword is and people could play to win the sword and vice versa. If the sword leaves your company because you're bad to the owners of the sword or you're bad to your customers, uh, this kind of thing could happen. So it is very interesting to see these things put out there. And I think a lot of people think they're just putting out an NFT like an art piece. Like, for example, the curio cards could be taken and put into one of these games. And if you have three of the curio cards from the set, your ship could run faster. You could mine better. They, the possibilities are infinite. And another thing too, as a creator, and we created the cards and you made yours and all this, we've kind of lost control of it. It's out there. It's going to be what it's going to be. If it goes in this game or that game, or it's on open sea or it's in a wrapper. I mean, I have no control over any of this, neither do the team or you or anybody. So uh, it is exciting to see what happens. That's a cool point about the serious games. There's a few other names that goes by, but serious games are, they're serious. And there's um, real governance in play on online games like Eve and other games. And it's a cool point also about that, the levels of organization. So when you have something that's interoperable and not trustless, but specific trust, then it actually enables an even higher level of organization. Like if you can have the gold bar, you can connect to civilizations. Going back to what we were saying about the interfaces for communication, you can interface between two games. And somebody will say, well, why would this game developed by this company 
have any sort of relationships here. And it's like, well, we don't have to tell them to talk to each other. We just have to have interoperability and then let it let, let the cards fall where they may. <laughs> It'll be pretty exciting when the first uh, Grand Theft Auto game starts using World of Warcraft <laughs> currency. And, and you're like, wow, I can buy, you know, guns and I can buy swords and I can buy all these different things. And I played the one game and I transferred it to the other game at an exchange rate and so on. Uh, Grand Theft Curio Private Key Edition. Your car goes faster if you have a full set. And it's the original 2017 NFTs. Nothing we could do about it at all. Oh, yeah. He's not playing with a full deck. You know, can't can't be trusted. It could be like special clubs. They only let you in if you have a full set of curio cards. It could be all kinds of things like that. <laughs> what are you most excited about seeing happening like in the next, I guess, few months? We have a fun party of some kind happening soon. I'm, what else I'm is happening? I'm excited for, uh, well, I guess it's only four days. Um, we still <laughs> got to kind of get the, the rest of it together. We're hoping... We're hoping we can have it here on World Crypto Network, uh, but I'm not sure where the community is going with that, if it's a public party or a private party. But we are having CurioCon 21 uh, on May 9th, honoring the day that we launched the first Curio cards. It's a pretty nice thing uh, people have thought up in the Discord. And again, with stuff like this, it's, it's better if other people do it. If I'm all out here like, my project's so great, we should celebrate it every year. It doesn't really work. It seems like nonsense. But when other people say that and on their own goodwill and their own interest in the project, again, they can buy as many cards as they want. They can be as self-interested here as they want. I can't stop that, nor can anyone. But uh, yeah, it's super exciting. We're going to have a curio card uh, party of some kind. Uh, as far as in the space, uh, I've been pretty excited by the Tops MLB launch. Uh, it was really hard to get cards, card packs at first. Uh, I couldn't buy them. And then I managed to buy a few. And I opened them, and it was all the pack mechanics that I thought they'd have. They had the commons and the rares and the uncommons. And then I went around buying all the, uh, all the Oakland A players, just like I would normally. And I have this little uh, web page I look at that's all like A's and Giants. And I got some Garbage Pail Kids. Uh, so I'm just loving the Wax uh, platform over there. They did an ICO uh, after our project, I think 2018. Uh, they developed a really nice uh, exchange interface. Still a little bit of a database. It, it put some words out there that people don't know, like schema. Uh, I should never see that word on a, a public uh, front web page. Uh, but they're in a hurry, you know, and all that kind of thing. But uh, they still managed to launch tops and garbage pail kids, baseball cards, Street Fighter, uh, potentially other properties. And and tops just did a great job with the, the packs and the rarity and the, the opening the packs and uh yeah it's been super fun it was always what i pictured when i started curio cards i was like someday i'll do this with baseball cards and it turned out it was four years later like on the dot just ready one funny memory about the oakland athletics because i grew up in the bay area was we used to be able to get half price tickets in usd half price usd because we were under 18 and so we could watch these games and have fun and it would always crack us up that for each player, it'd say he has the most home runs of anyone under 30 born in North Dakota. It's like they had a, a statistic for everyone, a third most home runs by this, you know, sub, sub, sub category. And then that's kind of coming back to um, what Antonopoulos said about on the playground. It's like everyone does have an individuation. And then there we were in the stadium seeing that each player was, of course, unique. And then that expands into the digital realm. So it's just funny that things that used to be just conceptually available are now just objectively there. I wonder what it's like for the players too, because you used to, if you went to a card shop and you really like sought it out, you could find out how much your card was worth. You could find out if it was trading or if it was one of the populars or whatever. Uh, but now they just go to some web page and they click down to their name on a drop down and they can see all the cards with their name and their face and how much they're selling for. And uh, some of these guys have millions of dollars. They could go in and buy their own card. And as the mechanics are, they could even burn their card. They could make their common card the most rare card in the set by buying them all, destroying them all. And maybe it's a media campaign. Maybe there's a public relations guy out there taking notes. And uh, we're going to see this soon for some ball player we never heard of. 
Uh, but yes, all these options are on the table. Uh, Tops has even done things like combining multiple cards together. You're like, why is this common card selling for 20 bucks? And it turns out you take this common and two other commons and combine them together to get a better card. And I'm just like, these guys thought of everything. I, I just love everything they're doing. One other thought on that is all art is performance art. And Mad Bitcoins knows that better than anyone. It's like the art being sold and then the art self-destructed. And then that increased it in value. So we already have something like a precedent for that. And it's the continuing relationship with the art, the artist and the community of respect and of attention. And again, now there can be a real bi-directional continued conversation. And yes, artists explicitly or secretly could do all kinds of stuff. They could pump, they could make a social media campaign. And it's like, they already could. But now there's something where everyone can look at it in the commons and it brings the performance art to a level that back when I was just doodling in class would have just been, you would have been the funniest time traveler I met that day. See, it's like the Wizard of Oz. You always had the power to do this. It was always, it was there all along and uh, you know, we just empowered you. And then now... Uh, everyone else is empowered. And it's so funny because the things that we used to have difficulty explaining on Curio cards were like, these are blockchain collectibles. These are digital collectibles. Like you, you want your money on the phone. You're going to want your baseball cards on the phone. And people would be like, why? Like baseball cards are valuable. This phone thing, not valuable. And now they're so into it that they put minting numbers on everything. And they're like, oh, I only collect number ones from the mint or I only collect number tens and all these different specifications and rarities. They really went all out. They, they did everything. Pay, pay no attention to the random number generator behind the proprietary source code. And with Tops, they are paying lots of attention because there's many rumors about the distribution of the cards. And I think you're a math person. You'll probably get a kick out of this. But uh, they said, well, 28 of 28 of these ultra rare cards have been discovered, yet... 30% of the packs have not been opened. Therefore, the distribution's wrong. Some of these rare cards should be in that 30%. They're worried that Tops didn't do it right. And to do it right in a, in a card way of thinking about it is you print all thousand cards, you distribute them all into the packs so that pack number one is always pack number one. It's not a random thing. You The card should be there. And if they didn't do that, if they took a shortcut and made it easier because it was easier to code or it took less time or whatever, People are going to find out and possible, you know, lawsuits and such just from coding uh, choices. It's always fascinating to me that the source code is audited, for example, for slot machines, because, hey, you wouldn't want to go into a casino and have, uh, you know, this return on your investment rather than that return, even though it's a losing gambit, quite literally still there's an audit level. And so it's like the scratchers at the gas station, if those weren't randomized. And so there's all this layer. And again, if you just walk into one gas station, you lose, you walk out, you're not going to think about the bigger picture. And so now when we can all connect and when we can all mathematically look at something or do statistical analysis, it's like, hey, what's going on here? And you can find that out just by looking at the, the unalterable record rather than some anecdotes that you and your friends have never won at that gas station. That's kind of weird. It's like, well, no one has. That reminds me of a great video that went viral recently about the McDonald's ice cream machines. Uh, at first, everyone was like, these machines are always broken. And they just shrugged their shoulders. And they're like, okay. And then there was a McDonald's app where you could find out. And a guy wrote it. He went and, you know, invaded the McDonald's app, took all their data and figured out when these ice cream machines are down. And he's like, they're down 30% of the time. This is too much failure for an industrial company like this. It should be five to 10% or, or less even. And um, then this other guy who does videos and, and investigative reports started investigating it and went to, down to the manuals and try to figure out what's going on. And a bit of a spoiler here if you guys haven't seen it, but it turns out it seems like the machine becomes too full and it can't complete its cleaning cycle. And the menus are purposely designed to be hard to read and understand. So it, all the manuals lead to calling the uh, attendant and he has to come in and fly in and get paid lots of money. And the company's making 25% of the money from their repairs. And it just seems like they're designed to be hard to use and designed to 
get this attendant to call. And it's this massive conspiracy that we would have known. Everyone just shrugged their shoulders on the playground. They're like, yeah, sometimes you can't get ice cream at McDonald's. Uh, the, the people would just say that machine is broken when really it's likely in a cleaning cycle or it's not completing its cleaning cycle because it's too full. And uh, the interface is designed to obscure this. And it's just the greatest little mystery that this guy figured out. Toto, the dog, in the closing scenes, open source intelligence riding in again to reveal what should have been known. It's been, it's been pretty amazing. We're learning lots of stuff. And uh, I think that's a good point to end on. Uh, certainly, I think we come back again, talk more about art, NFTs, Bitcoin, and what's going on. Uh, thanks so much, Daniel, for being on the show. Thank you, M Bitcoins. It's really been a pleasure and look forward to all of our next adventures and maybe collaborations together. And where can people check out your work? You still have the Flickr or Twitter, anything like that? They can go to danielariefriedman.com. That's my personal website, or they can look up my name and Flickr. That's where they'll find me. All right. Thanks so much, Daniel, for being on the show. Peace out. This episode was sponsored by NFT Ventures Miami. Become an NFTV artist. Sign up today. Easy bit. Easy bit. Easy bit. Bitcoin ATMs. Easy bit.